Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Our Small Footprint. My name is Nessa, and if you're new here, we are a family of eight who live off-grid in Australia. So today's video is a little bit... Uh, it's food related, which is what we're trying to get back into the swing of. Uh, and it is to do with the pork rolled roasts that I buy from um, Costco. So we buy these large pork roasts. They're $6.99, $7.99 a kilo. I think they just went up recently. Uh, they have rind on and they're a rolled shoulder roast. Uh, we use them for a lot of different things. One of those things is mincing up and making sausages and other things from it. So this is a bit of a what else we use those porks for and what else you can use this cheap cut of meat Four to make some interesting meals out of. So we minced up, I actually bought four in the before Christmas shopping trip. We used one as a roast, I'm pretty sure. We we used, uh, yeah, I think we used one half of it as a roast, half of it as the birria, and the other three we minced up, I'm pretty sure. So we just minced up three of them to use as sausages. Uh, what we used went into sausage casings, what, as many sausage casings as we'd soaked, and then what was left is what I've used here. So uh, these we buy about, they're about seven kilos, and they're around about $50 each is around about what I work. But I think that was when they were $6.99 a kilo, and I think the last trip I went they were $7.99 a kilo. I'll have to check that. But they have gone up slightly. Still an extraordinarily cheap piece of meat, and we try and use it in a lot of ways because of that. Now, pork is classed as a red meat, so it's fairly forgiving uh, date wise, taste wise, usage wise, uh, and it's fairly good for you. So, uh, it works out, it works out well. It carries flavors really well too. So, uh, this is what we did to, with this leftover one. We, I'll show you how we make our frittatas, uh, how we did some Asian style rice paper wrappers and how we canned some potato and sausage soup. Now, the, Frittatas we make with a bunch of different things, so this is what we happen to use for this round, but it's very similar for all those. So come along and see what we got done with one of these, well, three of these big roasts at this particular time, though I've already shown you the sausages. So I think the sausages used up around about, I want to say 10 kilos, 10 to 12 kilos, 12-ish probably, of the mint. So we were left with, I don't know, three-ish kilos of mints left to do what we did, and this is what we got done. So this is when I was mincing it. So I used the Louvel mincer, which I really adore, where I've spoken about this before. It is a fantastic mincer and is so much easier than using the KitchenAid uh, attachment that I was using prior, especially for this large amount. So what I did was I minced it all up to make it into sausages. So it had been pre-marinated using smoked paprika, garlic, some Worcestershire sauce, uh, cowboy candy, caramelized onions, uh, spices, all that sort of thing. Whatever we wanted to put in our sausages, was it was marinated with. And then it was all run through the mincer with some added fat to it as well. And then this was when I was doing it for the sausages. So you've already seen most of this footage, but just wanted to, to touch on it again. So we mince it all through on a coarse grind through the mincer so that we can use it for filling the sausages or whatever else is done. So this is how that's how we mince the, the meat initially to start with. Now, one of our common uh, lunches and things like that that we do is frittatas. We always have plenty of eggs. We have a large quantity of laying hens, so we always have plenty of eggs. Well, not always, but we, we most of the time we have plenty of eggs. Uh, and frittatas, I make two of them and it takes 24 eggs. So they're a really great thing to use any sort of leftovers for. So they're good for any sort of leftover meats and veg. Uh, you can use steamed veg from the night before or sauteed uh, stir-fried veg from the night before. You can use uh, any sort of meat. You can use chicken, you can mince. Uh, I've done smoked sausage ones recently, anything you like. So this particular case, we've got that pork in the fridge. So that's what I'm going to do. So the pork that hasn't been put in the sausages is still raw. So when I make my frittatas, I like to cook everything up because it makes the frittata cook quicker once it's in the oven. Uh, so I like to cook all my sausage and everything up, make sure it's all well and truly cooked before I stick the eggs on it. I just find that works better for me. So I cooked up all the sausage mince I like to put onion and garlic and stuff in there as well so it would have been whatever was caramelized I think I caramelized some onion first add some garlic and then added the sausage but the sausage this particular sausage is very well seasoned so it doesn't need a whole lot it would depend on what meat you were using like if you were using chicken off a roast chicken carcass then you're going to want a little bit more flavor because chicken doesn't carry a whole lot of flavor in that particular instance uh, though again it's personal preference on how tasty you want your frittata to be as well so I cooked off the mince with the uh, onion and all that sort of thing. And then I use greens from the garden. So I use whatever I have. Uh, tops of 
beetroot leaves, uh, turnip leaves, silver beet, kale, anything that's edible, carrot tops if I've pulled carrots, any sort of spinach, anything that's green and leafy. Uh, and I use the stems as well because it's getting cooked long enough that you can use the stems as well. And I slice it all up and I saute it off with the meat and stuff as well just to wilt it a little bit. Tin corn, uh, vegetables, as I said, leftover vegetables, anything like that. Little cubes of potato, they have to be cooked or they won't cook in the frittata, generally speaking. They need to be at least par-cooked. Uh, but potato anything like that we make them dairy free so all I do is I use my thermomix because I like to get lots of air into my egg mix and I do 24 eggs with a tin of coconut cream and then half that of water so it's 12 eggs per cup of liquid basically and we use coconut cream because we don't use dairy but you could use cream milk whatever you wanted almond milk anything like that rice milk we like it with coconut cream because that's what we use for most of our baking so 12 eggs to a cup of liquid and i blend it in the thermix as i said because i like to get lots of air i spread all the filling between two different pie dishes uh, and then just pour the egg mix over the top uh, you don't want it too full because you want to be able to carry it from the bench to the to the oven for a start but also it will puff up as it cooks now i do my all my baking on a barbecue because we don't have an oven so uh we did have an lpg gas oven that we used it was second hand one but uh the thermo coupler died in it and we've actually had three that the same thing have happened and i think they're just not meant to be used out on an open patio so we use the barbecue we've adapted we got a wood stove as well so we make do so excuse the grubby barbecue and it always it has to be if you're cooking on a barbecue you need to lift it up off the hot plate so it's on upside down stainless steel colanders in there as well uh, once it's baked we tend to serve it with a drizzle of homemade mayo as a topping uh, you don't have to obviously you could use a sauce you could have it just plain it's plenty tasty enough on its own but we like it to have with a little drizzle of mayo it is nice hot or cold uh, we do reheat it on the stove if we want it warm but the kids will just pull it out of the fridge cold and eat it as leftovers so it's a great snack high protein uh, uses anything you've got and makes it taste good pretty much uh, and can be eaten hot or cold and self-serve which is always a wonderful thing for in my house one of the other things that we use the pork for a lot is asian inspired foods so in stir fries in spring rolls in things like egg roll in a bowl all that sort of stuff uh the pork does well in that for for that sort of thing i also make uh steamed uh barbecue pork buns which are really nice and i'll use the pork mun pork mince with the hoisin style sauce to put inside those pork buns which is really nice uh, so we find lots of ways to use this pork because it's such a cheap cut of meat i saw a a reel or something oh, i think it was a reel on instagram but i'm not sure to be honest but uh, i saw somewhere online these fried rice paper package roll things that i thought i'd give a go so when i've made spring rolls previously i've used the frozen spring roll pastry and it's a pain because you have to store it in the freezer for a start but it doesn't come apart very easily it's kind of fragile and it's a lot of work to pull apart and so i sort of thought well maybe rice paper rolls using rice paper rolls and cooking them would be nice like we eat cold rice paper rolls uh with salads and stuff in them uh, hot meat cold salads but i don't normally fry them off and i discovered that you can apparently so rice paper you store in a pantry rather than in a freezer which is ideal uh they're still a little fiddly though uh especially when you try to make enough for eight people <laughs> eight people who are whinging that they're hungry uh but i thought it might be a, something to try because they're shelf stable rather than going into the freezer so what I did was I cooked up the pork mince as well uh, and then I cooked up a whole lot of vegetables with it. So I had a cabbage from, I think it was the hamper, this particular one, might have been the garden, I'm not sure. Uh, sliced up the cabbage, carrot, onion, I had some dehydrated mushrooms so I put them in boiling water to use the liquid in as well as dicing up the mushrooms. Garlic, I think there was a bit of sesame oil, uh, maybe a bit of oyster sauce to, to sort of darken it up as well and made the filling then you lay the rice paper roll, paper out so you have to dampen rice paper to use it when you get it it's really brittle you wet it and it becomes more flexible you don't want to over wet the rice paper because it will just end up too hard to work with so you want to dampen it and put it on a damp surface and it will continue to rehydrate as you're using it 
And so this particular one, instead of rolling like a spring roll, which can be kind of challenging, it's done as a parcel. So you put a, like a rectangle of the filling in the middle and you fold it up like a present. And then you get a second piece of a rice paper and you fold it the opposite way so that it's got multiple layers on both sides. I thought it was kind of nifty. It is using two rice papers per uh, one, but there's probably more filling in it than there would be in a spring roll because in a spring roll you'd need less filling to be able to roll it adequately. So it probably evens out in that. And rice papers are pretty cheap. So it's neither here nor there. I don't know how good they are for you though because they're rice in a paper. But anyway, so they get cooked in a pan with some oil. So we put a, a little bit of oil in a pan and we're cooking them and then you put them one side and you flip them the other side. Now they were a fair bit of work. They stuck to the pan quite a bit. I don't know if we needed more oil, if the pan wasn't hot enough. I, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, we did a few different things to try and help out, added a bit more fat, tried a couple of different types of fat and that sort of thing, but it still stuck quite badly. But because there were so many layers, it didn't tear open as such. It just tore layers rather than tearing the actual whole parcel open. So it wasn't so bad. They weren't crispy for very long when you took them off either. And I don't know whether that was because we undercooked them, which is possible because we were a little wary of overcooking them. Uh, but we did put them on a rack afterwards, uh, but they didn't hold their crisp. Like spring roll pastries hold their crispy, generally speaking. Uh, you get them crispy in the pan, they hold their crispy. So uh, it was it was super tasty. It was super fun to do and I'll probably do it at least once more and test out the whole process but I don't know whether it would be something that I put on constant rotation because it was a lot of work for a similar result to something that wouldn't be as much work if that makes sense so we will give it a go at least once more it's a good way to use the mints as a as an alternate sort of a thing uh, but I might want a couple of other sides pre-made as well so that when the kids are waiting for them to come off the pan they're um they have something else that they're snacking on as well if that makes sense but definitely worth having a look at anyway and a good way to use that mince up but it's similar that sort of style of thing is very similar to what we as i said asian inspired food the pork mince goes well dim sims steamed buns uh spring rolls stir fries that sort of thing that pork mince lends itself well to that one of the other things that we do with the pork mince is we can it. So we like the Zuppa Toscana, I don't know if that's how it's said, soup. It's an Italian soup that's done with sausage and potato uh, and we really like it. But uh, it, to can it, you can't can certain things. Well, you can, they're just not as nice in my opinion. Uh, you, can't add, you can't can any creams in it. You're not supposed to can any creams in it. A lot of people do. You're not supposed to can any creams in it. So we make this basic sausage and potato, sausage and potato, <laughs> sausage and potato soup base is what I call it. So it's basically a Zuppa Toscana base soup. And all I do is I use those marinated, that marinated pork with potatoes in a stock, basically. So somehow I missed the fil filming the cooking the pork off but basically i cooked the pork off like i did anything else in the cast iron cooked it all off and then we start filling the jars so the idea is that we put about a third of the jar in the meat product which in this case is the mince use a slotted spoon to pull it off the pan because it's going to be very fatty because it's pork mince you do want some of that fat in there so i'm not going to pat it dry or anything like that but i i don't want excessive amounts of fat because it can interfere with the seal when you serve this soup, we serve it with coconut cream, lemon juice, and greens. So silver beet, kale, whatever else. So this flavor base, you want this sort of a salty, hearty sort of a base. And then you're going to lighten it up when you serve it. So you get about a third of a, the jar up with the sausage meat and you want it ma marinated or uh, flavored. So in this case, we've already marinated it. If I was cooking it off without a marinade, then I'd want to use some Italian herbs and things like that to make it a, a nice tasty mince because it's going into a soup. So the taste gets diluted when it's in a soup. After we put the pork in there, we fill the jars with the potato. So for me, I just fill the rest of the jar with potato. You could use any mix of veggies here that you wanted. We don't regularly have excess veggies to can like even when if i if i go and buy carrots purposely to can then i could and i could get them nice and cheap in certain points of the year but the kids like to eat them fresh they don't really like them canned so if i'm making soup then i buy them and i can that soup pretty much straight away in this particular case we're canning later on in the month we, there's still a couple of kilos of carrots in the fridge but the kids are eating them mostly so uh, I'm not going to put any other vegetables in here we have potatoes from the garden so that's what I'm using peeling a peeled 
the scabby potatoes that needed using and diced them up for this as well as whatever potatoes I had on hand. So I filled the rest of the jar with the potatoes. You then fill it with stock or your liquid of choice. You want your liquid to be hot because the sausage in the bottom's hot, the potatoes are room temperature. You want to fill it with hot. So you can boil a kettle and just use hot water if you want uh, and then flavor it later. I like to use stock. So I like to use chicken stock normally, but I didn't have any bones to make fresh stock and I didn't have any uh, excess anywhere. I'm not going to open a jar of stock to put it in a jar that's going to be processed. So I didn't have any stock on hand, but that's why I have Thermomix stock paste. So it's a chicken stock paste that I've made on the channel before. I'll try and remember to put a card in. It's basically chicken and vegetables and salt cooked up till it's pureed and it's a flavor base. So what I did was I filled a pot with hot water and then I put the flavor base in it and I brought it up to a simmer. So then I basically got chicken stock. Uh, it does have some granules in it rather than being a nice clear liquid, but it's going into a soup and that becomes irrelevant. So I heated that up to put in the jars and then you just fill the jars up to the neck with the hot liquid water stock whatever you're using up to the, the rim of the jar you want about an inch headspace uh, things will shuffle around in that jar tomato uh, tomato potato swells a little bit but the sausage will shrink a little bit so it'll even out in the end uh, these jar then you want to debubble the jar you want to make sure you debubble it because those chunks of potato and stuff are standing around so you need to stick a slim object plastic preferably or wood uh, down into the jars and jiggle everything around to make sure any air bubbles come up to the surface and top it up with a little bit more stock if the stock level is looking a little low after doing that. Once you've done that we're going to clean the rims. Uh, same process as always with canning. This, the last part is always the same. You want to clean your rims nice and well. This has stock and stuff which means that there could be fat on the rim of the jar. So white vinegar, clean cloth, wipe the rim of the jar, make sure there's no fat that can interfere with the seal. I then put the rings on the jar. These are Fowler's Vicola jars, so they have a rubber ring that gets placed around the neck of the jar. And I wipe the those down as well, just in case I've transferred any fats or anything to the rings as I've been putting them on. We have stainless steel lids that go on top of that. I personally wipe out my stainless steel lids with a cloth and vinegar as well, purely because everything in my place is outside. We have an outdoor kitchen. We live in basically a desert. It's uh, very dusty and sandy and dirty. And I prefer to do it. So what I do is I rinse off my lids before I use them and then I use white vinegar to wipe the insides of the lids just to make sure that they're nice and clean. Once I do that I then place the lids on top and I put the clips. Now clips for Fowler's Vicola, I mention this every time just so everyone's aware, Fowler's Vicola only set states one clip is required per jar. They also state that the jars are not to be used for pressure canning or not recommended for pressure canning. I have never had a problem with pressure canning them ever and they are a lovely thick glass compared to other pressure cannable jars so I don't see why they would have any issues but they do say that they have that they they do not recommend the jars for pressure canning only for Val Fowler's Vicola method just as a side note. They also state one clip is plenty but they also don't recommend them for pressure canning so I like to use two clips. My clips are second hand. They're stretched. They used to have a name on them to say like a number on them to say what size they were and they don't anymore. And there is four and a quarter clips. There's glass clips, things like that. So whilst I have two different size clips in my container, some of the larger ones are odd sizes. So I use two. My personal preference, you do not have to. You can use a single one, uh, but I personally use two. So I double clip my jars uh, and then they're ready to go. Now these jars are 1200 mil jars and a quart is only 950 to a litre. So these jars require extra processing time. So once the clips and everything are on there, uh, you need to fill your, your canning pot. I'm using my Buffalo canner because it fits seven of these size 36 jars in there. So you want approximately three quarts of water or three litres of water in the bottom of your canner for a pressure canning. You want to put the rack in the bottom so that the jars aren't sitting directly on the bottom as well. And then you place your jars in there. So I put all seven jars in there and then, uh, sorry, you want to bring the water in the canner up to the same temperature as the jars as well. So you put your three quarts of water in there and bring it up to the same temperature as the jars before you put your jars in. Then you place your jars into the canner and put the lid on. Once the lid is on, you turn your canner up to you know, high mid temp and wait for it to start venting. And once it starts venting, you want to let it vent for 10 minutes. So once there is a steady stream of steam coming out the top, you let it go for 10 minutes 
and after the 10 minutes you place your weight on it. Now this buffalo canner doesn't have a pressure gauge, it only has a weight. This is a 15 pound weight, so you put the weight on there. Once the little red pressure gauge is popped up and the weight is jiggling, that's when you start timing for your processing time. So as I said, these are a 1200 mil jar, that means they require a little bit more time than a quart jar. The thought process is that they require 20% more time to make sure that the middle of the jars get to the correct temperature during canning. So these will go for 108 minutes at one from the time that the weight is jiggling and once the 108 minutes is up then we take turn it off and let it come back down to pressure. That red little red valve needs to drop down back into the pot because it doesn't have a pressure gauge that tells me that there is no longer pressure within the pot and then the weight can be taken off crack the lid wait five minutes open the lid and pull the jars out and then you have shelf stable sausage and potato soup on your shelf ready to go for whenever you want and that soup as I said when we serve it we tend to put the soup in a pot uh, the kids really like it with macaroni noodles which is fine I, it's not my cup of tea but the kids are welcome to add noodles to it if that's what they want so they add macaroni noodles to it and an extra jar of stock. Daryl and I like it as the standard classic serving. So we put a glug of lemon juice, uh, a glug of coconut cream and some greens in it and then serve it with bread. That's how we like it. So it's a really great base to use for however you want to use it for soup. You can add other vegetables, you can add other jars. So sometimes the kids will mix a jar of chicken soup in with the sausage and potato soup or they'll just add a jar of canned potatoes or just stock or whatever add pasta to it however they want it's really great in winter to have plenty of these jars of soup on the shelf because they can just serve themselves dinner straight from it they just go they grab a jar and they heat it up and there is dinner done and ready uh, i'd love to have some single serves of this soup on the shelf or any soup to be honest uh, because that would be great for lunches as well they could just grab a jar off and heat it up have soup and bread or there's nearly always some bread around that I've baked some sourdough sometimes a couple of days old which is when it's nicest with soup toast it up and have it with soup so it would make great lunches as well if I could get enough of it done the biggest problem is that I don't tend to buy meat in bulk because it's too expensive so like I might can these these seven jars of soup in one shopping period it might be an eight week shopping period six week shopping period and we might go through most of that within that one shopping period or the next one because I'm only really buying enough food to last us for most of that period there is a couple extra quite often like regularly there's a couple extra of whatever I can that gets carried over which is how I end up with a little bit of a stockpile but then you have incidents like what's happened over the last eight weeks so we've done an eight week shopping period. We've had the car break down and have to be repaired half a dozen times. Daryl's had to travel for that, which has cost us. The garden is not producing at all and all that sort of thing. So uh, we're down to next to nothing on the shelves because we've had to use it all, which is great. That's what it's, that's what I do it for. I can and I preserve so that we have food in the lean times, not for just, you know, like uh, shit hits the van or whatever there's lean times in everyday life when you just don't have as much money coming through so this benefits us in the, in those times as well but it'd be really nice to have a full shelf of things like this so that the kids could grab them for lunches as well as I said there's always bread but regularly they'll have peanut butter on bread instead of anything a little bit more or they'll share out the leftovers from the, the night before to have with the bread or whatever it'd be nice to have especially in winter to have some of these jars not the big ones the smaller jars of soup some nice pint jars of soup and stuff on the shelf so maybe that's something I'll aim for over this next few months to aim for over winter I do want to do some baked beans too so I bought some navy beans so I could can up some baked beans because I really like baked beans uh, but the canned ones that you buy in the shops are full of sugar so let's see if we can make something that still tastes good but isn't quite as full of sugar so I'll bring you along when I do that as well so thank you very much for watching again and I hope this has given you some ideas of what you can do with some of the cheaper cuts of meat. Uh, there is some really fancy things you can do with this cheap cut of meat and the canning of it is a great thing too because as I said it's only like six, seven dollars, seven or eight dollars a kilo. So even if I bought a whole one to use purely for canning, which might be what I end up having to do, buy a whole one and mince it and make pints of soup up out of just that one that one extra piece of meat then that might be a way to go as well so thank you and i will see you again on the next video bye guys